www.ejcc.org, and that's ejcc.org. And uh, for Redefining Progress, I think it is just redefiningprogress.org. I'll look it up for you and, and give you the phone number too in case you want to call them because they're right here in, in Oakland. So local number 510-444-3041. And that is rprogress.org. I was wrong. www.rprogress.org. The phone number for EJCC. Four 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 three zero four one and five one zero. I'm Pratap Chaji. Thank you for joining me. Thanks also to Erica Bridgman and our other uh, engineer, whose name I'm sorry I forgot to ask. Thank you so much. <laughs> yourself this holiday season and get behind the scenes of the KPFA Crafts and Music Fair at the Concourse in San Francisco, Saturday, December 10th and Sunday, December 11th. Volunteer two or more hours of your time to help us produce this annual public event, now in its 35th year. To learn more about how you can be a part of this production, please contact Maria at 510-848-6767, extension 245. Or email me at maria at kpfa.org. And you're listening to 94.1 KPFA in Berkeley, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, or online at kpfa.org. The time is 1.31 p.m. Up next is Making Contact. Stay tuned. This week on Making Contact. E também, se o Brasil está um passo à frente, if Brazil is one step ahead of everybody else, it's not only because of what the government did, but because people did. The pressure of, of the society made the government do something. Grassroots groups in Brazil have successfully educated sex workers and many others on the dangers of AIDS. The Brazilian government provides free medicine for anyone who is HIV positive something that doesn't happen in all parts of the U.S. American activists say we can learn a lot from the Brazilian experience. Independent producer Reese Ehrlich reports from Rio de Janeiro. Also, listen to the songs of Sayer Jorge, a Brazilian musician who came from the slums and championed the cause of the poor. I'm Tina Rubio, your host this week on Making Contact, a program creating connections between people, vital ideas, and important information. It's a warm night along the Copacabana Beach, and young people are participating in the mating rituals common to any big city. 18-year-old Allison Almeida and two friends are hanging out on a street corner wearing tight jeans and stylish t-shirts. They carefully eye women dressed in halter tops and even tighter jeans. I asked Allison if he found a partner tonight, would he use a condom? AIDS is, is a very concerning problem, so I, each time, I, sometimes I didn't use, but uh, each time I, I face the situation of the sex, I, I, I use it. How about these guys? Do they use condoms? Condoms? Do they do they have condoms with them now? Yeah. Where does he carry his? Yeah. In his wallet. In his wallet. Three. Oh, he's, 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 he's very lucky. He's very optimistic. He's very optimistic. Let's be honest. A lot of times, guys don't want to wear a condom. Does that has that happened to them? Josh. So far. He said first time. Yeah, yeah. He a lot of times. A lot of times. You know, it's a kind of you. You're so hot. You're so hot in that moment. Yesterday. Yesterday happened. The attitudes of these young people illustrate the difficulties faced by any government in trying to combat AIDS. In 1995, the World Bank estimated there would be 1.2 million Brazilian AIDS patients within five years. Yet a combination of government programs and grassroots organizing has produced one of the most successful anti-AIDS programs in the world. Today, Brazil has only 310,000 registered cases of people living with AIDS, down from 540,000 just three years ago. So how do they do it? This is the, our infectious disease world 
Dr. Paulo Bajoso heads the infectious disease department at the Federal University Hospital in Rio. We don't have any more specific beds for wards for HIV patients. They are admitted together with all other patients in the same unit. Dr. Bajoso says international experts would not have believed Brazil was capable of treating AIDS patients so effectively. In the 1990s, they told him that the only way to stop an AIDS epidemic in third world countries was to emphasize prevention. Dr. Bajoso says such advice was, effectively, a death sentence for people already infected. They're talking about prevention, prevention and prevention, and we had relatives and family dying of HIV, and we couldn't do anything for those, those, those guys. So I think that now, if you look back, we see that it's possible to, to give therapy in developing countries. Brazil has shown that. Since the late 1990s, under pressure from non-governmental organizations and AIDS activists, the Brazilian government has provided free medical care for any AIDS patient, including free blood tests, exams, and advanced medications. Yes, it is expensive, but uh, it's doable. And it will take only a small portion of the money that we are using for other purposes in the world, like war. This would be shocking in the United States, yeah. as you know. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> it's strange, because some people thought that we shouldn't be doing this thing, but I think that's the only way that you can guarantee uh, drugs for everyone. Why, why? What was the argument against it? Uh, some people say that uh, you should put money in other things, like education. This is not a, a high priority. But government programs are only half the picture. Grassroots groups provide the impetus for the anti-AIDS campaign. The nonprofit group HIV Vida operates out of a makeshift office here at an old bus station in a working class area just outside Rio. Claudia Jane Araujo, president of the group, is herself HIV positive. Her case was typical for Brazilians diagnosed with the disease in the 1980s and early 90s. Não acreditei. Achei que a médica estava louca e não me cuidei. Continuei vivendo. She didn't do anything about it. She didn't take care of it until 96, when she got really sick. All the diseases that usually associate with HIV, tuberculosis, herpes, and pneumonia, they all came together at once. O HIV pode produzir veio tudo de uma vez. Araujo says dedicated staff at a government hospital saved her life and helped her become an anti-AIDS organizer. Activists like Araujo help educate and organize people underserved by the traditional public health system. Having treatment and drugs available is one thing. Getting poor people to utilize those services is quite another. <laughs> On this day, Araujo is visiting Sandra Poligar, a 36-year-old cook's assistant who is HIV positive. Poligar says she was diagnosed as HIV positive five years ago, but didn't seek treatment until she had some AIDS symptoms. HIV Vida played a critical role in making sure she got treatment and helping her deal with the aftermath of her diagnosis. She was really depressed. Her viral coverage was really high and uh, the support of the group, she took part in the meetings, she was explained how to take the drugs correctly, what they would do, their side effects. She would take the kids and they would look after the kids, so she felt it stronger, it made her stronger to be part of the, of the group. Those drugs have to come from somewhere. For most third world countries, the cost of importing AIDS drugs, even at discounted prices, is prohibitive. The Brazilian Ministry of Health spends two-thirds of its entire AIDS budget on just three drugs manufactured by the U.S. pharmaceutical companies Merck, Abbott Laboratories, and Gilead Sciences. In order to bring those costs down, Brazil embarked on a unique and controversial policy. It started manufacturing its own drugs. Here at the state-owned Farmanguinhos pharmaceutical factory, supervisor Jorge Margalais opens an airtight door leading to the special machinery making generic antiretroviral drugs for AIDS patients. Workers wear white bunny suits with special hoods with respirators that cover every inch of their bodies. Why do we wear all this special clothing? Uh, because these areas restrict 
because we are producing antiretrovirus. Yeah, it is necessary uh, special clothes, special control of this area. Is the clothing to protect us or to protect the drugs? Protects uh, our Earth. This machine produces about 40 per million capsules per hour. 40,000 capsules per hour? Yes. That is for antiretrovirus. Mm -hmm. So to fight AIDS? Yes. Eloa dos Santos Pinero was the factory director at Farmanguinos. She worked for multinational pharmaceutical companies in the U.S. for 18 years. The Brazilian government asked her to calculate the cost of manufacturing anti-AIDS drugs. She compared retail prices for drugs made by Merck and Roche with the actual cost of production. Why the price of uh, the drugs under patents, why the price so high? These institutes does technology does research and then I can buy uh, the raw material from anywhere and I calculate the cost and I saw that uh, Merck, Roche could drop their price also. She estimates that Big Pharma charge 80 to 90 percent over the cost of production for AIDS antiretrovirals. For other drugs, the difference is even higher. There is some products here for hypertension. One difference between my price and the price in pharmacies, 2,000 percent. 2,000. They are so greedy. It's incredible. Pharmaceutical companies argue that they must pay more than just the cost of raw materials. They spend a massive amount of money to research and develop drugs. So their high prices are justified because they must recoup those initial expenses. Pinheiro says that bunk. She can research and develop a drug for 10% of the cost claimed by the multinationals. They calculate about $500 million to develop a new entity. I think they exaggerate the cost and research and uh, 10 times more than our calculation. I know that there is a difference of salary. There is one thing that uh, I know they have a, a, we haven't. They pay for lobbies, they pay for uh, marketing, they pay for a lot of things. Brazilian officials said they won't let the multinationals get away with charging outrageously high prices. Every few years, they engage in very tough bargaining to lower the cost of AIDS drugs. Under international law, Brazil can declare a health emergency and then manufacture the drugs as generics. Dr. Mauro Schechter, an AIDS expert in Rio, says that gives the government a lot of leverage. The fact that drugs can be locally produced at a lower cost is also an incentive, so to speak, for branding companies to, to sell at lower prices because there is competition. AIDS activists in the U.S. have taken up the fight in support of Brazil's demands and are drawing additional lessons from Brazil's movement for better health care. moment, we'll hear more about the grassroots movement against AIDS in Brazil. You're listening to Making Contact, a production of the National Radio Project. If you'd like more information or for cassette or CD copies of this program, please call 800-529-5736. That's 800-529-5736. You can also visit our website at radioproject.org. Aid activists in the U.S. have held demonstrations in support of Brazil's demands for lower-cost drugs. John Iverson, a co-founder of the AIDS group ACT UP in Oakland and Berkeley, says Brazil provides a positive example for the U.S. He says Brazilian health officials actually provide more reliable drug treatment than the far wealthier U.S. government. In Brazil, actually, the treatment is more universal than it is in the United States, where there are waiting lists for AIDS drug assistance programs. AIDS hits minority communities in the U.S. particularly hard. In 2003, of the country's 902,000 diagnosed AIDS cases, 20% were Latino and 42% African American. Iverson says in the South and Southwest, patients often can't get free drugs until they become disabled from AIDS. They wait till they get sick. 
and can qualify for Medicaid and Medicare. Brazil has seen that you don't wait for people to get sick. You treat them, they stay out of the hospital, they don't need social services, people aren't collecting unemployment, and they're still in the economy paying taxes. As a result of strong domestic and international pressure, in early October, Abbott Labs agreed to reduce by nearly half the price of its AIDS drug, Calitra. Negotiations continue with the two other multinational drug companies. At his hospital pharmacy, AIDS specialist Dr. Pajoso says that keeping down the cost of drugs makes their free distribution a lot easier. These were the patients come to, to get their medicines, so we are going to get into the pharmacy. Mm -hmm. Someone comes with the prescriptions and they're checking if she's in the system and all this kind of thing. Dr. Bohoso says all his patients now get a full array of internationally accepted anti-AIDS drugs. This is Istabudin and you have Indinavir, so you have all the drugs. So it's a mixture of the drugs made in Brazil and uh, those made by uh, right. international drug exactly. companies. Exactly, exactly. If I lived in a small town or a village in uh, rural uh, Brazil, would I still be able to get these drugs and the medical treatment? Yeah, certainly, yes, but uh, as in any country, if you go to the middle of Texas, probably it's going to be harder to have access to medicines and therapy than if you are in New York City or Miami. So, But still, we have uh, AIDS programs working in most of the states and most of the, uh, the cities, the big cities. According to nonprofit groups, Brazil does provide the all-important antiretroviral drugs needed to treat people who are HIV positive. But government clinics often don't have the antibiotics needed to treat pneumonia and other diseases associated with AIDS. AIDS activist Araujo says while Brazil has taken positive steps, the government still needs to improve delivery of health care services to the poor. If Brazil is one step ahead of everybody else, it's not only because of what the government did, but because people did, of, because of all the organizations, all the deaths and all the, the losses of lives that are now gone forever, the pressure of uh, the society made the government do something. At a restaurant along Rio's Copacabana Beach, prostitutes grab a quick bite to eat before resuming work. Some of them are very critical of how government hospitals handle AIDS patients. Daughter of my roommate, she she contract HIV, and she went to she went to the hospital to get the the free medicine, and she stayed on the line to get the free medicine, and she stayed so so much time that when she got the, the right to get the free medicine, she was she was already in the terminal phase, so she died. But she and the other sex workers say that, on the whole, the government's anti-AIDS program works well. AIDS education helps, according to this prostitute, using the name Maria. Are most of the men you meet uh, Brazilians or foreigners? Americano, English, Francais. American, Italy, French. I work usually with, with tourists. Are they willing to use condoms? In yes. Yes. Yeah. Is this vision? They demand to use condoms. All oh, the men demand. They demand. Yes. The women demand also. AIDS activist Araujo, who was a prostitute for a time, says grassroots education of sex workers has been particularly successful in Brazil. Either with condoms or no sex. Some men even wanted to pay more not to wear condoms, but according to her, they are very responsible. They don't accept it. Maria says volunteers from non-governmental organizations are the key to successful AIDS education. Unlike some government bureaucrats, she says, they have empathy for the sex workers. They do a campaign on that. They motivate us to use the condom and talk about the aspects of the disease. Each summer they, they come here, they go to the, through the beach, they distribute condoms and, and uh, folders explaining about the diseases and etc. They're volunteers also, and uh, I think this is very interesting. I don't think this is a pressure from the government. It's, it's a good thing. And it's, try, it's try to make people, make more, people aware. Think more aware of yeah. 
Dr. Pajoso says Brazil has significantly reduced AIDS cases through a combination of grassroots activity and government policy. He notes that AIDS remains a major plague in Africa and some other parts of the world. Everybody in the world who works with HIV needs to recognize that there's this disparity of having tons of millions of people dying uh, w with HIV without having access to drugs that are available in the developed world. In the developed world. Uh, this big difference between rich and poor countries is not acceptable anymore. This is a, a tragedy. HIV is a tragedy in, South, in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America. And Brazil has shown that we can make a difference if we try to, to work together. American AIDS activists say that is perhaps the number one lesson that Brazil has to offer. The fight against AIDS requires more than a government providing services. People must get organized at the grassroots. seen Sayur Jorge portray the tough gangster in the Brazilian film City of God or as a shipboard singer in The Life Aquatic with Steve Zizou. Jorge is a talented singer-songwriter who combines samba with elements of funk and hip-hop. These days, the 35-year-old works as both a singer and actor. As Rhys Ehrlich reports, Jorge grew up in a poor favela and hasn't forgotten his roots. As a young teenager, Seor Jorge taught himself to play guitar. He soon discovered that it was more than just a musical instrument. His sister and manager, Maya Jorge, translates. Na prática, era muito simples. As pessoas me viam passar com. It was actually a very practical way of communication in the beginning because I used to walk around here, Rio, with my guitar. And, you know, we used to see those people sitting in bars on the streets, having a beer, and people was like, hey, you, oh, hi, uh, you, you have a guitar on you, why don't you play for us? Não sei por que você se foi, quantas saudades eu senti. E As cadeiras são lá de fora do bar, mesa, as pessoas tomando uma cerveja. I was communicating with my guitar, making friends. Jorge used those communication skills to put together a local band. Then, six years ago, he burst onto the national scene in Brazil. His first CD, Black Tie Samba, contains lots of original songs based on samba, but fused with funk and hip-hop. Jorge hasn't forgotten his roots in the favela. He performs a song from the 1970s called I Am Favela that speaks proudly of poor neighborhoods. Ah, favela, nunca foi reduto de marginal. Ah, favela, nunca foi reduto de marginal. Ela só tem gente humilde marginalizada. E essa verdade não sai no jornal. A favela é um problema social. Todos eram negros na favela. Aí a música passou a ganhar. He wore this band uh, with uh, only black people coming from favela, and and slowly this music starts to to have a different meaning for us in stage. Favela is considered for many as um, the place where all the, 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 the thieves and all the, the bad things in, in this world came from. What the, the song says is exactly the opposite. Favela is made of real people, honest people, poor people, who has dignity and who has no one to, to defend them. In Brazil, Seor Jorge is best known for acting in the film City of God. It's based on the true story of a favela resident who eventually becomes a newspaper photographer. Jorge portrays the ruthless head of a local gang. 
He said the movie works because the director cast people who came from the favelas in key roles. We all were very familiar with this universe of favelas, and um, we were the sons and, and daughters of these people who had passed through all that experience. So it, it was very familiar to all of us, the story that was being told. For me, uh, what I believe that makes the movie so recognizable and so strong is exactly the fact of this casting being so authentic. In another film, Life Aquatic with Steve Zizou, Georgie performs 14 of his own arrangements of David Bowie songs. <laughs> He says he really didn't know much about David Bowie's music before working on the film. So to tell you the truth was a big surprise because David Bowie is a big artist of a great value and very well known. But when I was young, when I was in favela, this kind of information was unreachable. It was not the kind of music that I could read or I could know. So the only the only um, tune I was familiar with was Let's Dance, because it was a great hit in the 80s. The challenge was to preserve the, the simplicity and, and the nature of David's music. So our guitar was designed for a different kind of harmony. For me, it was um, a, a rediscover of my talent to have to deal with David songs and to have to, to deal with the simplicity and the music and to, to, to be honest um, after working with David Bowie music it has uh, brought to me uh, this influence uh, is changing my composers uh, actually and, uh, and is bringing different uh, things to my music now Sayer Georgi recently released a new CD Crew which means raw Unlike his highly produced previous CDs, Crew is stripped down to just singer, guitar, and percussion. I wanted Crew to be a CD for emotion. When I was designing Crew in my mind, it was more calm, it has a different concept. It was especially designed for France, for my public in, in, in France. And after that, it starts growing and growing. Georgie no longer draws much of his audience from the favelas, where highly processed pop music is more popular. But he continues to advocate for the poor in his lyrics. Brazil's center-left president, Ignacio Lula da Silva, was elected with strong support from the working class. But Georgie and many others now criticize the president for failure to help the poor. I was expecting more. I am very disappointed with him and, and I believe that uh, um, we are all very disappointed because um, everyone that comes from the people, for example, like the poor people who suddenly are being, being heard or, or are doing good stuff, like Lula, for example, who was just like every other person poor people in Brazil, when, when we all suddenly trust someone like us because we believe that for being from the same situation it will help you know, with our problems and then suddenly we realize that uh, Lula wasn't strong enough. Jorge says many working class and progressive people in Brazil share that sentiment. Lula is finishing his time and power now, and unfortunately he didn't manage to show any interest in helping or in changing anything. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not alone, I'm, I'm, I have many other people with me that believe in the same, and the future of my children depends on it. I do believe in, in the future, and I do believe that I can help. Sayo Georgi toured the U.S., Canada, and Europe earlier this year. His latest CD is called Crew. For Making Contact, I'm Reese Ehrlich, Rio de Janeiro. Thank you so, so much. See you.
That's it for this edition of Making Contact. Research reporting for this story was funded in part with a grant from the Kaiser Media Fellowships Program. Special thanks to translators Beto Mello and Blue McGammerman in Rio. Our theme music is by the Charlie Hunter Trio. Making Contact is an independent production funded primarily by generous gifts from people in the community.